Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, in the last session we talked about uh, visual culture and as I promised today we are going to talk about the theories, uh, not, not talk about the theories, but about the application of visual culture, how it can be made interesting. So, here we go, these are the various things we will be focusing on, visual perception, its key components, form perception, depth perception, color perception and we will stop the interaction with that. So, what exactly do we mean by this? Now, the first question we will ask ourselves the is what is perception? We talk about perceiving things, experiencing things, but what exactly does it mean? Well, we will not go into scientific theories about it, but uh, what we are going to focus on is the fact that at a very basic level we have sensations. We have five sense organs and they manage to send us various kinds of signals and then there is interpretation. Now, let us let us get this clear. For instance, uh, when I am looking in front of me, let us say I see you, but what I see basically are a series of colors or a group of colors of various kinds, uh, certain forms and I am able to locate them at a certain distance. What I am able to do is I use my memory, I use with the help of memory uh, interpretation and I say that okay, what I see in front of me is a human being. So, perception involves first the sensations which are then within the brain processed to processed compared with existing knowledge, memory and images of earlier human beings I have seen. So, that within the scheme of things, within a schema finally, I say that okay, what I am seeing is a human being. So, obviously, in the context of perception, there is something that you see in, in visuals and some kind of uh, interpretation judgment that you make of it. So, you combine the two and you have perception. If we quickly go back to some of our very early classes, where we talked about the concept of interpretation, you see a glass of water and you say that uh, what do I see? I see a glass of water. Somebody says that uh, what I see is uh, symbolic of hope. So, what is happening is that the moment these things uh, happen, the experience of seeing is being processed in different ways or somebody says that I see a particular kind of a glass, uh, which is which is uh, different from the other kinds of glasses I have seen so far and somebody says that the water is clean. So, you are looking at the same thing the sensations being perceived are the same, but the way you interpret it may vary from person to person. Okay. Without going into the details of things, in philosophy, psychology and cognitive sciences, perception is the process of attaining awareness or understanding of the sensory information. So, whatever you experience through the senses, okay. receiving, collecting, the act, action of taking possession, apprehending with the mind are the senses. So, grasping that in in a very broad way can be uh, what is uh, can be defined as perception. We will not go into these, but uh, very quickly you see that uh, stimuli is transmitted in our brain sensations, then at that point of time it is devoid of any meaning or interpretation. These are the simplest bling building blocks, but then they are taken up by the mind, they are analyzed with the help of memory of various other things that are stored in our minds and then they are given a name, a definition, interpreted, remembered for future use and then we have what is known as a perception. Now, interestingly, uh, one of the very significant uh, thinkers about perception, philosopher, psychologist William James tells us that part of what we perceive comes from outside, but the major part of it comes from within the mind. And that is how you see that when we talk about illusions and various interesting other things of that, that kind, 
you see that his saying makes sense within that particular kind of context. Now, I will be showing you a few images and uh, we will be talking about them. If you look deeply into this particular image right at the center of this image, then you see a triangle. Okay. The triangle apparently does not exist, but if I ask you this question why do you see this triangle? What is basically happening? Why is it that you are seeing this triangle, this white triangle and not anything else? Is not it possible to say that actually this is a pattern, this is a pattern, these are not circles, these are only cir almost incomplete circles like a cake half eaten. Can't you consider that these are three uh, angles which have been placed there? Why after if everything is said and done, you again look at the center and perceive a triangle? Because you see that a process of interpretation is going on. You are assuming, you are framing, you are kind of conceiving that okay, if an invisible or a white handkerchief folded and is, is placed on three circles and a triangle at the center of it, then probably this is the pattern which will emerge. Why is it that we perceive things in this particular way? These are intriguing questions, people still struggle with the answers, we have interesting answers. Uh, for why this happens. In this case, uh, when we have completed certain things, we have learned about the basics of uh, form perception and depth perception, probably we will get a little better idea about why this happens. Now, to resolve ambiguities and make sense of the world, the brain also creates safe from incomplete data. So, the data you saw right now was incomplete okay? and we have a tendency to try to complete what is incomplete. So, this is incomplete and we try to complete it and in the process of trying to complete this, if we have a pattern like this, then we say wow, this completes the pattern. So, this tendency of the brain to complete that which is incomplete is probably at the basis of why we have subjective perceptions of this kind. So, illusions. Earlier also I shared with you another illusion and here is another example of the illusion where you see that this line looks much larger than uh, much smaller than this line. This line looks much larger than this line. Why does it happen? Obviously, if you will measure then you will find that both the lines are of the same length, but you see that you are seeing the thing in two different ways. At one point of time, you are seeing a two dimensional image as a three dimensional space, where you have a building block. You can see this as a wall moving over here and then there is another wall which is connected to this. This is one kind of seeing that you are doing. At another point of time, you are trying to see something as a flat surface and you are trying to make comparison between two lines, which may or may not be of equal length. So, you see that two kinds of seeing are at conflict with one another. So, again this is about perception, which tells us that perception is not very easy, not very simple, there are complexities involved, there can be conflicts which can give way uh, to certain kinds of understanding, which lead to what is known as illusions. So, the earlier example was where there is a tendency to complete things which are incomplete. In this example, we find that two different ways of seeing can exist at the same time and create a conflict, thus giving rise to what are known as illusions. So, in this case it is because of something which is known as size constancy. The further away a thing is away from us, the smaller it looks. Now, this is something which we use very significantly when we experience the concept of distance. We will talk about it in a little while from now. Orientation is something which uh, we took up a little earlier if you remember. Now, let us talk about it in a more detailed way we are oriented uh, to see things in specific ways and hence you see that this is interpreted as convex and this is interpreted as concave. Let us take this exploration a little bit further. Why is it that this happens? Because we assume that this area is in shadow okay? and in this case this area is in shadow. These are our assumptions. Why are we making such assumptions? because in our day to day life generally light comes from the top and if light comes from the top and if an object is convex then the shadow will be on the lower part of the convex surface 
and if it is concave then the light will be uh, uh, light will be in the lower part and the shadow will be in the upper part and on a convex surface the light will be on the upper part and the shadow will be on the lower part. So, you see that preconditioning orientation that we have had towards seeing lights almost almost at all points of time from the top makes it very easy for us to make these kinds of interpretations, but these are nothing more than perceptions of specific kinds. Now, let me take a moment to twist this and change the orientation you will find that we will face a certain kind of a difficulty. Okay. So, what we have here right now which I will quickly share with you is that now it is probably much more difficult to find out which is the convex surface and which is the concave surface and this happens because you see that uh, the uh, when it when it comes to light from sites the light can come from any site and windows you find can be on located on either side of the room and the light naturally has an issue coming in a particular way. So, <coughs> orientation is very very important for us what we see over here is uh, a little earlier we talked about uh, uh, the fact that uh, the Chinese read from the top to the bottom. We also talked about the fact that the uh, people who read let us say Arabic or Urdu script read from the left to the uh, from right to left that means that this, this is the way they are oriented. Let us do a small experiment look at both the lines that you are seeing over your s on your screen which one seems more easy to draw this one or this one which one seems more easy to look at this one or this one. The generic answer for most Indians would be that this object on this side is easier to look at from left to right and very often from the bottom to the top. So, it is slanting up that is very often the way we scan things and this is important to remember because with the way that it is advertising or holding or a presentation what you which we are making if you realize this then you will realize that based on that you can design it in such a way that the image can be either placed on the left hand side or the right hand side depending on what exactly you want the person your audience to look at first. Okay. So, this can be a very interesting strategy for the future. Now, we will uh, not uh, go into the details of this uh, the eye is there from the eye the information goes to the brain and then to the more advanced part of the visual cortex where processing takes place, but you see that uh, when we are talking about the eye we have rods which are monochrome and in activated even in low light we have cones which give us color vision. But as I told you they are all about sensations, but uh, at the end of the day what we have what we experience is perception and I have kind of uh, quickly shared with you how it takes place. Now, let us look at something else which is attention because perception is something which is intermediated by or mediated by what is known as attention. Now, let me share with you very quickly uh, something. Uh, uh, which uh, many of you may or may not realize. Let us take a moment off and look at uh, this particular slide. If I ask you quickly uh, uh, if you cannot see me that is if you if I ask you quickly uh, what is the uh, what is it that I am wearing which is an artificial device then probably you will think about it some of you now that you can see me may remember uh, the specs, but by the majority of you might miss out the fact that uh, I am wearing a lapel microphone okay, over here which sometimes you can see. So, you might have missed it out. So, what is basically happening over here? What is happening is that you have not been attending to me. If I ask you a series of questions about what is the color of my hair or what is the color of this thing or what is the color of that thing, we mostly miss these things. Here is an example of what I was trying to share with you. Have a quick like look at it and then let us go back to the earlier slide. Now, you tell me how many umbrellas were there, which was the tallest umbrella when we were looking from the left to the right, what was the color of the sky behind the umbrellas, did we have anything uh, below the umbrellas, was it the same color, what was the color of the thing which was uh, beneath the umbrella, 
is was there a gradient of texture was there anything else there other than the umbrellas to many of these questions you may not have an answer not only because you saw it for a short while but because you see that if you see it for a long time you would be attending to it so you see that uh, you would be attending to it and uh, you would be looking at so many different things that you might have missed out. So, what basically happens is that uh, attention is a, a process intense process of filtration of focusing as well. So, perception is not good enough perception is where we have we have we are experiencing everything around us, but focusing is where we are attending to one aspect of things just one thing at a time and please remember even those who are multitaskers there is the possibility which research tells us that only less than 10 percent of the people can actually do attend to do two things at the same point of time or they are actually genuine multitaskers. The majority of us are only capable of doing one thing at a time attending to one thing at a time driving and not being able to focus on what we are telling okay, on the mobile. So, that is why you see that driving and mobile I mean talking on the mobile can be very dangerous. So, what basically happens is that uh, there is a process of filtering it could be for limited mental capacity, but for whatever reason the end result is that we are able to attend to only one thing at a time. Now, this has very interesting implications in the context of visuals why because you see that if you are able to attend to one thing at a time then an artist can manipulate your attention he or she can decide that okay, if I use this particular color or if I use this particular shape then it will be more exciting more interesting the person will look at this thing first then here will move and start looking at something else next. Now, we do a lot of eye tracker studies even I and some of my team of scholars do a little bit of eye tracking studies and we will so share some of those slides with you uh, as you look down and uh, look at the material which tell us that uh, the eyes move in specific patterns depending on which particular object is there. So, this is a very interesting thing as you can see from the eye tracker studies that we will be sharing with you or we have already said we will have to check it out. So, <coughs> now that I have talked uh, about the basics of perception let us get down to the business of using a toolkit which consists of form perception, color perception and depth perception because these are the things which are going to help us understand uh, how they can be used more effectively for communication okay, when you are using the visual medium. Now, you see that uh, the term gestalt German uh, we used to indicate uh, the form forming capability of the mind the holistic capability of the mind and if you remember right at the beginning we talked about the ability of uh, um, our mind in the last lecture of uh, trying to complete that which is incomplete we talked about it a little earlier in the case of the subjective perception of the triangle also. So, this tendency is something which has been explored by certain people in the early 20th century 1940s and 50s and these people were able to evolve a set of theories as to what happened. Unfortunately, at that point of time they were not able to tell why it happened why is it that we tend to see the whole rather than the part and things like that. Today a lot of research on co in, co in the field of cognitive sciences explored these issues and if you are interested you can see some of uh, Google and find out certain things relevant to this. Okay. But getting down to business these are very informative tools which can help us become more effective communicators. The first point I would quickly like to make is there is something which is known as foreground and background when we talked about listening we talked about foreground and background today here also we are again talking about foreground and background. If you look at uh, this uh, image with birds you find that if you are able to identify the black bird then somehow you tend to ignore the white bird when you are focusing on the white bird you tend to ignore the black bird that is because you see that this becomes the foreground this becomes the background and when this becomes the back foreground this becomes the background. Okay. So, there is a reversible process taking place we are switching between two different kinds of perception, but more important we are switching between looking at something as foreground and looking at something else 
as the background. This innate tendency which exists of seeing something against something else is very, very important for us to realize. If you remember right at the beginning, I talked about frames. You are able to see my face within the frame. You are able to see the PowerPoint within the frame. You are able to see the a computer within the frame of your whatever building or whatever the window whatever. So, we keep on having frames, frames within frames and in the context of perception or focusing on something framing or using frames is a very interesting device that we use. So, these are the theorists although we are not going to look at their theories in detail who talk about different kinds of form perception and that is what we will look at again about figure ground relationship very very common description where you can switch between uh, either looking at a vase right at the center or looking at two faces, but you cannot see both the things at the same point of time because you switching between two different ways of looking at things. This can have interesting consequences when you apply that to visual communication they can make for interesting pictures, intriguing pictures, draw attention can do a number of things. We talked about subject to contour, contour a little earlier, so we will skip that for the time being. But there is another interesting thing which happens uh, when we are perceiving form which is we tend to group things together. If you are looking at the six lines, we tend to see them as three sets of lines rather than as six lines. When we see people clustering together, we tend to consider them as a group. Okay. This is one group standing over there, that is another group standing over there creating groups this is again a very interesting tendency that we have. We try to make sense of the data which is scattered in this case we try to create the shape of a star or whatever. So, this is known as the law of good figure and this tendency is very much in it trying to make sense of something. Okay. Continuity when you are looking at this particular image probably this is considered as continuous and these are considered as things by accidentally uh, things which are accidentally over there. And this is a another very interesting tendency that we people have and uh, these are all linked to the concept of forms different forms how we align them or how we try to make sense of by linking them together how we try to get a sense of completeness out of that. So, this is very interesting and these are small instances of the way we categorize and classify uh, different kinds of forms. Now, here are examples of, of form perception figure ground relationship because you can see over here that uh, the cart you can either consider it as a part of this landscape or you can consider it as two figures sitting on a horse cart. You can have two different interpretations of the same thing and uh, this is interesting because uh, you see that this leads to switching back and forth between foreground and background we talked about a little earlier. So, here is a visual artist who has explored that here is another where you see that discrete elements are brought together and if you look closely at it for some time you can identify a face. Okay. This is another technique which is known as closer uh, which is again a aspect of form perception where we try to bring discrete objects together and try to give it a sense of completion. So, we are able to see a woman, we are able to see her hair in spite of the fact that if you actually look deeply none of these things exist. Now, we quickly switch to depth perception and uh, again it is an important aspect of perception as I told you if you know about the basics of these three then you have get a good idea of how you are going to work with it. So, in the context of uh, depth perception, how do we make sense of distance? If you are looking at this image over here, you find that uh, you are able to find that there is a lamp post over here, there is a, another lamp post over here, there is a still smaller lamp post over here, there is another lamp post which probably is parallel to this. This is a two dimensional image and yet you are able to see things uh, and discern things like distance the fact that some things are nearer to us, some things are further away. How do we make sense of this? Think about it for some time and jot down a few points before we come down to the way that we do this. Okay, your time is out.
the first thing that we do is something which gets linked to the concept of linear perspective. What happens is that if you remember a little earlier I said with you that things which are nearer to us look larger and the same things when they are placed at a distance look smaller. So, if you are looking at the road over here you find that uh, the road actually takes you further away in the direction of a vanishing point over here okay. and uh, you see that if you are looking at uh, long distance roads they look like this. Because you see that the low road is gradually becoming narrower until at a particular point which is the whole line of the horizon if you actually are able to see the horizon you are no longer able to see anything other than a point. Here is an example of uh, linear perspective being used. Okay. So, converging lines you can see them over here. Now, here is another example of the way we make sense of distances, which is in spite of the fact that they are located on the same plane, we would say that this is in the forefront, this is in the middle and this is in the background. How do we do that? That is because we have a tendency of interpreting complete objects as being in the front and incomplete objects as being behind them. And hence, although the, the last object is the largest object, okay, it is the most distant among the three of them, because it is being blocked by this one and then by this one, we consider that this is the object which is in the forefront. So, the further an object is from the eye, the smaller it looks, but uh, and you see that uh, it so happened that uh, in one tribal area where people lived in very dense forests, there was a person and an European took him away from there and took him to a place where there was a vast landscape with buffaloes at a very long distance. And since this man had never experienced distance in his life, he initially thought that they were ants. So, this clarifies one interesting point that uh, our understanding of distance is to a very great extent learnt. It is not that uh, it is given to us intuitively. There are many such interesting things, but right now we will not touch upon those. We will focus on perspective as I told you these objects becoming smaller as they go for forward, the buildings becoming still smaller as they go in this direction. So, perspective effect which I was talking about. Now, having done that let us look at uh, a very interesting uh, house which exists in a museum, where as you move between the different parts of the house, you will find that as you move from this side of the house to this side, you have become very large and as you move from this side to this side, you become very small. This illusion is based on the fact that you have a distorted house. So, that as you move around, you see that the distortion kind of rectifies our perception and the illusion of okay, moving between a large uh, becoming a giant or a pygmy is something which is created in this apparently magical illusion house. Now, having said that about uh, depth perception and the way that it can be manipulated and can give rise to very interesting effects, let us now talk about color perception. This is the third and the most uh, significant aspect of things, because we live in a world where colors are becoming very, very dominant. Uh, there is a theory which tells us that colors are more conducive to emotions than black and white images. Colors play a very strong dominant emotional role and there will be some uh, reference slides which will give you an idea about how significant colors are. But here for the time being, let us quickly touch upon some of the basic aspects of colors. If you are looking closely, you will find that on the left hand side, we have what is known as the concept of additive colors. These are additive colors, the way we see it on television screen or in light and you put a prism and the light colors are divided into the seven colors. Okay. So, in additive colors green, blue and red are the main colors and the, when green and red are mixed, you have yellow, green and blue are mixed, you have cyan, red and blue are mixed, you have pink and then when all the colors are mixed in the appropriate proportion you have a white light. This is how the monitor and your screen on which you are seeing right now operates. On the other hand, we have pigments. 
the sketch pen and the various kinds of things that we use and we used to uh, ex explore uh, as kids and we make sense of color that way these are known as subtractive colors the colors become duller as you start mixing more colors and what basically happens is that these colors the primary is yellow magenta and a cyan some form of blue and as you keep on mixing them you have secondaries like uh, green and uh, you have secondary like red vermilion you have a secondary like purple now what's basically happening over here is that uh, if you remember in the slide which i have shared with you about making powerpoints i talked to you about primary colors and secondary colors and here are examples of primary colors primary color 1 primary color 2 primary color 3 these are secondary colors 1 2 3 and you can keep on mixing them to make still other kinds of colors now what is the role that colors play we can have a quick look at some of the things that happen uh, just to give you an idea because color is a vast field we will not be able to touch upon the major part of it today but at least we will be able to get a glimpse of how it operates certain colors are extremely bright for instance if you want to see the relationship yellow is much brighter than purple over here on the other hand if you are looking at red and green probably they are equally bright and if you are looking at uh, blue and uh, orange orange is fairly brighter than blue but not as bright as the relationship between let us say yellow and purple these are just to give you ideas about the fact that colors have different kinds of relationships colors can be classified as warm colors cool colors and uh, a n number of other ways of defining colors colors can give you a sense of happiness colors can create a mood of sadness which is what we will look at blue is a color which tends to cool you down to pacify you to depress you so we have the term blues okay whereas warm colors like uh, uh, cream tend to lighten the mood make you feel happy that's why you have sunlight green is a color which tends to make you happy maybe that's why you said that we associate it with grass or for whatever reason we will look at these issues a little later that color has such a significant impact so brightness you see that if uh, a color is very bright we have a tendency to interpret this this is not very clear on the screen but you can see this on the powerpoint which i'll share with you that uh, when a color looks very bright we have a feeling that it is closer to us when it is dull we have a feeling that it is further away from us now this is something which i have already shared with you earlier but if you look at this the dominance of blue and green gives a sense of calmness peace quiet other than the forms which are obviously semantically oriented they have communicate a certain sense of meaning of reclining posture of relaxing but even if you just look at the colors they play a significant role over here on the other hand the abnormal sky the the time of the day depicted the the shadows long shadows don't make this uh, uh, all these things don't make this painting a very attractive painting or a positive painting especially the color of the sky if you're looking at this this is definitely distinctively a negative image dominated by red color blue red and uh, deep dark dirty colors uh, of course the form the 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 use of diagonals which are rushing away from us all those things definitely play a significant role but in spite of that the colors also play a significant role here and this definitely gives us a eerie sense of uh, distortion of something which is negative you have apparently colors like pink which are beautiful colors but in the combination of uh, uh, the red and the black and brown over here and association of uh, a skinned animal which is hanging somewhere this gives us a very very disturbing picture of things from predominantly through the use of and the manipulation of colors on the other hand this has a certain uh, luminosity about it a certain degree of attractiveness about it but you see that if you are looking at the lines the dotted lines they to a certain extent disturb the smoothness of things or if you are looking at this image part of the image is positive and a part of the image is negative if uh, i might be permitted to i can very quickly show you how we can actually play around with it if you are looking at this part of the image it is distinctively positive 
but if you are looking at this part of the image, then it is distinctively negative. So, you see that uh, this small demonstration hopefully gives you an idea that uh, colors can play a very significant role. Here again you find that uh, in the two Tibetan Thangka paintings, the one on the left because of the colors is much more disturbing than the one on the right, which is uh, because of the colors less traumatic. So, colors play a significant role in cultures, uh, fashion industries thrive on colors at different points of time, different colors dominate. Age, the older people generally tend to use certain kinds of colors as opposed to younger people and even that depends from culture to culture, a classes difference uh, within courts. Uh, people uh, who are uh, financially better off generally tend to uh, use less bright colors, whereas people in the lowest economic strata very often use bright colors. So, trends of face and colors dominate everywhere including in advertising. And here are some examples from Betty Edwards experiments with her students, where you see that as you can see colors I like and colors and I dislike the significant difference the way that colors are associated with seasons and those colors are dominantly presented over here. I would give you an example, the same with this also color I like and color I dislike and you find that between the two students there is a certain degree of similarity. Similar patterns of colors are being used. Okay. Similarly, if you are looking at uh, expression of anger for a group of students, you find that similar colors have been used or expression of sadness for a group of students again similar colors have been used. And our own findings in a series of study with more than 60 students also gave us certain colors. The colors used dominantly in disgust, the colors dominantly used for peace, for sense of romance, for sadness you can find that the colors are distinctively different. And these are dominant over 60 students. So, the majority out of the 60 students make use of these colors. So, this tells us that colors are also classified understood in similar ways within a specific culture and that means that if we can make use of this if we knowledge, then when we are addressing somebody, then we can take care of things in a more effective way. Our studies also here give you an example of how happiness has been depicted, how anger has been depicted, fear has been depicted. You can see for yourself that the quiet interestingly correspond with many of the things I said earlier and the colors of happiness are related to yellow, green uh, and uh, blue uh, interspersed with white light colors, color of anger dominantly red, yellow and black and compare it with the picture we saw right at the beginning uh, by where we talked about let us say here we talk about anger and here we talk about something which is very disturbing, then we find here uh, that colors behave in a specific way irrespective of the fact that they may belong to even different cultures, European culture and Indian culture. So, these commonalities tell us that through colors we can communicate in a very effective way and we need to be aware of this. In the final phase of this talk, I will quickly touch upon illusions. I told you that illusions uh, or where uh, what we perceive is not what is true. Okay. And we have examples of that. Uh, I will not uh, go into the details, you can look them up in the slides, uh, but you see that here examples tell us that for instance, this does not look like a straight line, but is perhaps this line looks, this particular line over here looks larger than the other line. Perhaps these lines do not look like parallel lines, but they are. So, these are examples, uh, these lines look like curved lines, but they are actually straight lines. So, they are examples of uh, illusions and uh, here is an example of another illusion, where you are able to climb up an impossible set of stairs. Based on the work of uh, Acer, uh, the Dutch painter, this particular concept has evolved and you can again Google E S C H E R and find a number of wonderful images which explore a realm known as paradoxical images. In paradoxical images, nothing is necessarily correct, 
and nothing is necessarily incorrect. You have different ways of seeing things. However, before we go on to that, uh, here you can see that although the color of this square is the same as the color of this square, because the configuration against white and against green, you see that they have an interference effect on our eyes and we see two different sets of colors. This as one set of colors and this as another set of colors. And here you see that I was talking about uh, paradoxical images where transformations are taking place and you can look up ACES very exciting images to get an idea about them. And uh, the way that transformation day is transformed into night, night is transformed into day, sky is transformed into earth and earth is transformed into sky. So, it is a very interesting image and these are paradoxical images artists play around with which are exciting interesting. Here is another I will not go into explaining these, but I will just share with you how images manage to communicate paradoxically or create illusions which have very strong impact upon, upon our minds. Or this particular image uh, which seems very impossible until all we do is we turn it round and we suddenly realize that it is very very possible because Fukuda's experiments are very interesting and you can again check him out by on the on the web okay so i hope that uh, we have had an interesting session and you learned certain things which you can use in the context of visual communication as i told you please check out the links for some very exciting surveys some very interesting images and uh, the way you respond to them will tell us a lot of things and we will share your responses with you uh, so that we together are able to make some small tiny interesting discovery together and i hope that these lessons will at some point of time help you in evolving better communication strategies using visuals because now you know both about visual culture as well as how to apply visuals in various aspects of everyday life thank you friends